Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles 2008 Urban Lecture Series. I'm Fernando Guerra. I am the director of the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We established this lecture series over 10 years ago, and we did this primarily for three reasons. First and foremost, to provide an interdisciplinary education for hundreds of our students. Second, it is aired to over one million households like yours in the city of Los Angeles. Third, it also brings together government officials, business and community leaders, our students and others to discuss the challenges being faced by our city. For more information about the Urban Lecture Series, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and Loyola Marymount University, we welcome you to visit our website, which can be found at www.lmu.edu backslash CSLA. We hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we hope it inspires you to get involved in the challenges facing our great city. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles 2008 Urban Lecture Series. Today's panel is going to be about transportation. Uh, some of you talk about it as traffic, as some of you curse it as you're trying to drive down Lincoln Boulevard. And I, I know that uh, Professor Luke Itu uh, um, was talking about being late because she was trying to get uh, um, down the 405s uh, from, uh, what university is it again? UCLA. UCLA, I never heard of it, but um, <laughs> she says it's just right up the street over here. So. Um, let me introduce our, our, our two guests, and then we'll get into some question and answers. And of course, as always, we want the students really to ask a majority of the questions. Um, first, let me talk uh, about uh, uh, Mr. Um, Snowball. Roger Snowball of Dallas is one of the top public transit officials in the nation. Uh, he became the MTA's CEO uh, in September of two years ago? No, 2002. 2002, wow, it's taken, it's been a while. Mm -hmm. uh, he was president and executive director of the Dallas Area Rapid Transit District, or DART, from 94 until he came over to the MTA. Um, he's a, been a long career in public transpor uh, transportation that has spanned over 36 years, actually for over 40 years now. Um, he, uh, before joining DART in Dallas, he served as president and general man manager of the San Diego Transit Corporation, where he worked for 20 years, rising from the ranks of a planning and scheduling manager to the top executive at, in, that, uh, in that district. He, has, uh, as the new MTA CEO, he has won numerous awards, including the American Public Transit Associations, which named him Transit Manager of the Year in 1998. So he uh, obviously has a lot of experience, not only here in Los Angeles, but in Southern California, having spent, spent time in San Diego, and also in, uh, in Dallas. And we'll ask him a little bit more about his political career uh, in, in, a, in a second. Uh, next to him is um, Professor Anastasia Luque Itu Sederes. Uh, try to say that fast three or four times. Uh, she is the department chair and professor of urban planning at UCLA that I know several of you have applied to, so maybe after class you can ask her about your application and what's going on with that. I know uh, nothing. Uh, her research focuses on the public environment of the city, its physical representation, aesthetics, social meaning, and impact on the urban resident. Many of the issues that we have been talking about in this uh, urban lecture series. Um, she has done research that documents and does analysis of the social and physical changes that have occurred in the public realm, cultural determinants of design and planning, and their implications for public policy, quality of life issues for inner city residents, transit security, and urban design and transportation issues. Her uh, vita and resume are way too long for me to go through all the different studies. Let me just tell you that she is one of the top uh, from my perspective, one of the top academic and intellectuals uh, in Los Angeles, especially when it comes to uh, urban issues, transportation, architecture, and urban design. We're happy to have both of them here. Thank you for, uh, for coming. Um, so, um, Mr. Snowball, who do we blame for all the traffic? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> What got you involved in this? I know you're the head of MTA, the head of what was DART, which is Dallas, and the head of San Diego. When you were a college student, did you think that this is what you were going to be doing? Is this what you wanted to do? Well, let me ask you, answer your first question first. What's the, what's the problem with all that traffic? It's all of you. 
There you go. <laughs> you're, LMU you're, students, you know what? Well, it's everybody. Some, I bet some of the students actually drove from upper campus down here. Did anybody do that today? <laughs> oh, Jeff, you're going to, it's like, uh, that, that's a no-no, that's a man. It's much healthier to walk. Uh, <laughs> no, when I was, uh, when I went to college, I, I spent my, the first two years in college at the University of Akron in, in the Midwest. And um, my father wanted me to be an, an attorney because he was an attorney and he thought that should be what I would do. And I didn't like being an attorney. And um, he, he got me a job one summer in a planning office. And I liked that. I was outside, I was looking at land uses, I was looking at the city and trying to figure out what was going on. It was part of a transportation study. And so I went back to college uh, that fall and went to work at a like planning commission in Akron and uh, I was experienced. I had three months experience doing the studies, and so they hired me. I was the lead person for the study. We had 25 people working on it there, and uh, we, we, we were doing the first transportation studies. And uh, so I met in that, uh, in that environment, some of the people that I worked with in the planning office were also professors at the university in geography. And so I really started to figure out that that's what I wanted to do, and so I went to my father and told him, I wasn't going to be an attorney. I was going to be a geographer. And then he cut you off? He did. <laughs> uh, and he said, okay, that's fine, but you can pay for it yourself. And, and that was fine because I was working in the planning office pretty much full time and making money. And I could study, and a lot of it was... You know, so the moral here is go ahead and do it, but don't tell your parents until after tuition has been paid. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, yeah, I, I knew uh, in college that I wanted to build better cities. And that's what uh, I had the opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, in the planning. How'd you, get, how'd you get to San Diego? Um, well, what happened was I, in college, I, I was working as a professional. I was actually a junior planner before I graduated. And then I had an offer to go over to a bus company in Akron that had gone out of business uh, because they, they went on strike and the private owner just said, no, forget it, and walked out. And so it started up as a public agency. They needed a, a planner that could do things scientifically to put in the service scientifically. And so they chose me to do that. And so I worked my way up as a planner. We were doing uh, computerized scheduling mm -hmm. this long time ago uh, when the computers were as big as this room. And uh, <laughs> the city of, or in, in San Diego, they were one of the test cities for the same thing. They needed somebody, so they called me and I thought, I never saw the Pacific Ocean before and I'd like to, so I came out to San Diego, fell in love with it, and uh, got the job and five years later I was the general manager. So. What has surprised you the most from when you think about moving to San Diego and getting into this, and now after 40 years of doing this, what is the, the, the biggest difference between how we approach transportation and planning back then and what we do now? Well, the approach is actually very similar because what we were doing back in those transportation studies was really trying to figure out what the motivations of people were from going from one place to another, and what generates trips, what attracts trips, and how you can model all that. So. That whole process has just gotten more sophisticated because of the, uh, the advent of the computer and what we can do with the computer. Uh, what's changed is back in those days, the gas tax actually was more than adequate to build the interstate system, to fund a lot of the different transportation infrastructures that we have today, bridges, better roads. Uh, the gas tax was much better aligned with the actual cost of being able to do things. And what's changed over the years is not only a, a matter of more cars, um, but a lesser and lesser amount of funding each time. So even though our parents left us with, with really a great transportation system, we are in effect ruining that and we're letting it go to ruin and we're not replacing it for our children. Uh, so I think that's really the crux of the, the big issue that we all face. Uh, at one time, it was a much higher priority from a political standpoint and it's become less and less of a priority. The other really big, big thing is when I first got into the business, I thought, well, we could really do a lot with buses if we could just make buses faster and everything. And uh, technology's really changed, so nowadays we have much better transit systems than, than I ever imagined. The rail systems are, 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 are great. Uh, the rapid bus here in Los Angeles is a, is a really big advantage uh, for us. The Orange Line is a fabulous right. type of example of what we can do with buses. Um, but a lot of new technology is really coming into the play. And, the metro is really responsible for all transportation. It's not just a transit system. Like if you went to New York City, they just do transit. Mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. is just transit. Our, we're the biggest agency of our type because we're responsible for the highway planning, for bicycle planning, and goods movement. And goods movement's a huge issue. And before you get into that, let me 
continue a little bit with your career because we have a lot of urban planners on, on uh, uh, in the audience and just want to give them a taste for number one going into academia or being a practitioner or both because some of us uh, who are in academia also kind of practice in terms of consulting and doing those type of things. What took you to Dallas from San Diego? Well, oh, wait, you know, before that, how did you get the top job in San Diego? Well, I never, when I walked into the door, I never planned on doing it. I was a planner. I'm, uh, you know, oh, I, wait, you're supposed to plan if you're a planner. Well, yeah, I know, but, <laughs> but my, my, uh, you know, my head was at, I want to be the best planner there is. I'm going to work as hard as I can. I'm going to be the best planner. So one day they came to me and said, hey, we really need help in operations. You know, you really you do things well. You have a scientific approach. So why don't you take over operations for us? I said, oh, God, I don't know anything about that. All right, but if I'm going to do that, I'm going to be the best operations person there can be. And that's all I ever did was just figure I'm going to be as good as I can be. And then the next thing I know, I turn around, I'm 30, 33 years old, and uh, the, the mayor and my board chair come to me and say, we want you to be general manager. I said, you can't be kidding. <laughs> you know, but I don't... And so I put you didn't together. ask how much they were going to pay you or anything? <laughs> no, because it wasn't a choice. They, they, they told me what it was, and that was that in those, in those days. So, yeah, it was, um, it was just one of those kinds of things where I just was concentrating on doing a really good job. And, and that so was you were the thing. internal candidate, or even you just went within the ranks. You were a product of the San Diego system. They knew you, you knew it, right. and you just uh, um, were really recruited and e continue to emerge in that area? The, the general manager that hired me mm -hmm. um, just decided to retire. We had labor dispute going on. Uh, he didn't want to deal with it. Um, he retired. The mayor, who was Pete Wilson at the time, was really uh, uh, set on bringing our costs down because at the time, San Diego had the highest paid bus drivers in the world. And so it was really kind of an embarrassing situation. So they wanted to uh, essentially contract it out and shut the place down. Mm. So when they came to me, it was sort of like, hey, you get to be a general manager, but you may not be a general manager for long. Well, that was all right. Well, anyhow, we solved the labor dispute, and uh, we went on to San Diego was recognized uh, all those years as a really top-notch transit agency. But it got to be boring after a while, to answer your other question. Um, and uh, we, we did a lot of exciting things, but there was ever, never enough money in San Diego. And Dallas uh, was, uh, had passed a one-cent sales tax mm -hmm. to build light rail in Dallas. Now, you know, in, in Dallas, at, Texas... At that time, was there light rail in San Diego? Had the trolley we, started? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, had, we had built the trolley and uh, had operated for quite a while. Dallas was probably the fifth or sixth light rail system to go in. So I, I went there to build the system and to start it up. And in Dallas, it was really funny because, you know, I don't know how they ever left their horses but you're certainly never going to get Texans out of their pickup trucks. Right. Um, and, and what we did in Dallas was we built a very fabulous system that was fast and convenient, and it got a good market share of the So, But in Dallas, was there a national search for director, and you applied, or were yeah. you recruited to they be was, contacted and said, hey, come over here? They, were, they did a year's program of trying to find somebody. Uh, they tried to recruit me a year before, but they had a 25-member board, and I said, you've got to be kidding. I'm not going to deal with that. And then they, the legislature came in and cut it down to 15 members, and uh, they straightened things out a lot. And just the, the, uh, the, uh, the whole thing about being able to build a system from the ground up, and that included light rail and commuter rail, and really uh, improve the bus system and really do kinds of some of the things I wanted to do with buses, and then have the real opportunity to get into economic development, which we, we had. We did some of that in San Diego. But really, to, to do it from the ground up in Dallas was bad. And then L.A., what happened? Well, L.A., we, LA came to us and said, hey, we're looking for somebody. My wife and I sat down. We'd build a house in Dallas. We were planning to retire there. Said, this is great. Everything's going super. And uh, they came, and they kept coming and talking to me and saying, look, at this is the greatest challenge in the country. So yeah, my they, wife they were and right I, about that. My wife and I wrote, sat down. We had three pages of, of cons. Mm -hmm. And there was only three things we could think of from the standpoint of being pro. pro. Uh, the first was the challenge of the job. Mm -hmm. The second, our, our kids still are in San Diego, so we'd be closer to them. And the only other thing we could come up with is that they sell liquor in grocery stores. <laughs> Here, so. That, that way you can walk to get liquor instead of having to take yeah. mass transit. Yeah, in, in Dallas it's a little bit more difficult. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to ask you a lot about the MTA and, and all that, but first I, I wanted to kind of ask a similar set of questions to uh, Dr. Um, Luque E. to the Sedarius. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm at, not at pronouncing. At the end, you'll have it okay. exactly right. <laughs> okay. But that's why everybody calls me Anastasia. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Anastasia is uh, m much better. 
if you don't mind. I, I just want to inform the students, besides having a, a brilliant academic career and being the chair of the department over at UCLA, she's also been uh, uh, very important in terms of uh, civic life in Los Angeles, in terms of a consultant. She served as a consultant to the Transportation Research Board, the Federal Highway Administration, the Southern California Association of Governments, the South Bay City Council of Governments, the Los Angeles Neighborhood In Initiative, the Greek government, and you know too many other municipal governments to talk about. So she's not only a academic, a theorist, a researcher, she's a practitioner that's been involved heavily in terms of planning and helping design our transportation, uh, uh, our transportation policies, not only locally, nationally, but as you saw, in internationally. So um, how did you decide to get into this in terms of becoming an academic and why not just yeah. be a practitioner? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. I think that Exact, it's exactly what you said, that by being an academic in urban planning, because it is such an applied field, you are not in the ivory tower. So you can do really both, although you, know, you, you have certainly to spend a lot of time writing articles and doing research and all that. But you are not really in an ivory tower where you have absolutely no access to what's happening mm -hmm. around you. And for me, I, I would never want that. If this was the case, I wouldn't want to be an academic. But um, having a base in the university allows me quite a lot of freedom. So it, it does allow me to choose the topics I, I, I'm interested in. At the same time, I can do some real work, I mean, <laughs> on the ground by uh, doing consulting. I, I have actually started, I, one of the interesting things about myself is that I have never left the university in some sense because I continued, you know, from, the undergraduate studies to graduate studies and then doctoral studies, et cetera. But at the same time, I was working in public, private, or nonprofit mm -hmm. sector. So I have worked for art, what was what used to be RTD. I have worked for LACDC. I have done internships and work. I have really worked for a consulting firm, Cordoba Corporation, at the same time mm -hmm. that I was He's one of our regents here at uh, the university, George Pla. Yes, George yeah. Pla, exactly. And actually, their second in command is a graduate of our department, Maria Meranian, a transportation planner. Right. So, so yes, I, I am I am an academic, but this never stopped me from uh, you know having a lot of things that are real jobs and real uh, projects. So, why should a student be get a master's in urban planning, and can oh. they get a job? I you know are we. We find ourselves telling our students, please don't get a job before you graduate, because there are a lot of jobs out there. Uh, so don't, do, don't the, do what Mr. Snowball you did. Know, it's probably not the, the, <laughs> the money that one would get if um, one was to become an attorney, that's for sure. But um, what we find out about our students, and I think everybody who comes to urban planning, they all have a very proactive agenda. They all want to make things better for their communities, their cities, the world. And that's, that's not something that an attorney always can say. And so I think uh, that's something that... Well, really the attorneys want to do that. They just want to be paid. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> so how long have you been at UCLA? I have been at UCLA since 1990. So for 18 years, I'm at UCLA. And, and how much did you know about Los Angeles before you got here? Uh, I came as a graduate student mm -hmm. in another university, unnamed across campus, and then I as crossed the border. As long as La Pepperdine, you can say uh, USC. We USC. Don't, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I started knowing. It was quite a cultural shock for me initially. I was born and raised in Athens, Greece, a very dense, very, um, you know, you've mentioned about people as an issue, and I would add, actually, urban form is an issue as well, because Athens is a very dense city, but it has quite a compact urban form. And so when everything else fails, you can walk. I mean, you can <laughs> walk to a, lots of places. And that's a, not a big option here if, um, you know, you live in one place and your job is 27 or miles away, as in my case, where I live in Pasadena and, you know, I work at UCLA. Um, so what was... What was exactly the question again? I think In terms of how, what did you know about Los Angeles oh, before you came here? I mean, yeah. obviously Hollywood and all that I, kind of I, stuff. I knew about and, you know, Hollywood. Did, so and, you only uh, applied to USC because you thought of Hollywood. You didn't apply to anywhere else in the United I, States. I applied to both USC and UCLA, and I was admitted by both. But I was an international student, and we always have 
it's, it's a struggle at UCLA to fund international students because we, their tuition is three times more expensive than um, the tuition of domestic students. And so Which is still cheaper than USC, I, but... But I got a full scholarship right. at USC and I had to, I, I completed three degrees at USC without having to pay She's not a anything. high achiever, she just, so, you know, three <laughs> No, no, I, I didn't have to pay anything. So that was a big decision, you know, to make and, uh, but I'm glad I'm at UCLA. What surprised you most about Los Angeles when you arrived? The fact that there were not people on the streets, that was a big cultural shock for me because I was so um, used to actually even rubbing shoulders with people. I mean, it's sometimes, you know, you're walking on the sidewalks of Athens and there you're surrounded by people. You, you smell people. Sometimes it's not as pleasant. But, <laughs> but at the, the, the flip side of that and the positive side was that I never felt walking in Athens on my own as a woman, young woman at the time, um, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, I never felt insecure. And um, there were two things. I mean, one, there was no one on the streets walking, uh, even around USC there was, you know. And then I remember getting on the bus to go to City Hall to get some uh, kind of, uh, I was working on a student project at the time and needed some data, zoning data, etc. And I remember I was in the bus sitting next to an African-American woman who looked at me and she said, be very careful of your purse, hold it very clearly, this is a dangerous place to be. And that was another cultural shock that, and actually this prompted me to really study bus stop crime and uh, women's fear and of transit environments and all that. But I was so used to getting, hopping on the bus, getting off the bus, walking on the streets in Athens. Now a lot of things have changed since mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, early 80s when I was still in Athens. And it is probably a bit more dangerous place. But still, uh, the fact that you're surrounded by people and the fact that there are not many people in Los Angeles, that was a big one thing that surprised me. Roger, the Los Angeles Metropolitan Transit Authority. What is it? When did it get started? What are you guys doing? Uh, in the first place, it's the, the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. So it's Los Angeles County. County Transportation. It's not part of the county. Right. It's created uh, by the state as its own agency. It just has the same boundaries as Los Angeles County. Uh, and it's got a, a, a long history, depending on how you go back. It was a, 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 a transit operation in the RTD. It was a commission that was uh, set up to do all the transportation planning for the, uh, for the county. And then it got merged back in, I don't know, 92 or 94, something like that, into uh, LA uh, CMTA, what we call Metro. A lot of people call it MTA, but there is really no official name for that. And a lot of places like New York City, you really have an MTA. Yeah, but you do see MTA on a lot of things. Yeah, but they're not, that's just sort of slang. It's not official publications for us. Ours is Metro. You see, that's our, that's our name, and our brand is Metro, and we really work hard for that. In fact, that's copyrighted, and so we, uh, but there's a lot of metros around the country, Yeah, I was too. just going to say, but go ahead. <laughs> right, but, so, but it's really a unique organization, as I said. Because of its history, we do operate a very large transit system. It's probably the third largest transit system in the country. Who's one and two? Uh, New York City and the state of New Jersey. So that um, we have, we're probably right in there than Chicago and Washington, D.C. are, are kind of close by uh, in that regard, too. But it's a very large sy uh, system. It's probably the largest area covered by any transit system in the country because Los Angeles County is so big. Then we also have the light rail system, the subway system. We operate um, the freeway service patrol, which is, is you know, uh, the tow keep, trucks. keeps you going. And, that, and just so you know, that's not because we're nice. Think, you know, we want to you know, rescue you, it's because every time half of the congestion that we experience in, the, in our area is caused by somebody doing something stupid, breaking down, getting in accidents and that sort of thing. Every time you obstruct a lane, uh, that causes hours and hours of backup for all the rest of the traffic. So the freeway service patrol is really there, along with all those sensors and all that information we provide to the radio and TV stations all the time. That's not for their benefit, that's for ours, so that we can detect instances uh, incidences as quickly as possible and get it get that obstruction out of the way so that's really the whole purpose of it and we save hundreds of hours of delay because we can get to those those things clear them up uh, otherwise it can just go on and on as you know uh, we operate the the call box system although that's kind of archaic now because everybody has cell phones uh, we we're the biggest partner for Metrolink the commuter rail service that serves five counties 
Um, we do all the transportation planning for the SCAG uh, in our county, or in, in our county for this to go into the SCAG uh, plan, which is a six county uh, area. And uh, we're very much involved in <clears throat> the uh, movement of goods because we're, we're much more impacted by goods movement in our area than other urban areas simply because we have the two largest ports in America, or the largest port in America, the, the port of Long Beach and, and uh, Los Angeles. And all that freight coming through our area really messes up the transportation system. And 40% of that freight's going someplace else other than our county. And so it really is a big challenge to us, and that's where we're into grade separations and trying to separate the trains and the trucks from, from the cars. Uh, so we're, it's, a, it's a large organization. We have about 10,000 employees. Uh, we are, we, our um, policy board is a, made up of a board of directors with 13 members. The five county board of supervisors are on our board automatically by legislation. The mayor of the city of Los Angeles is automatically on our board. And by the way, they complain to me all the time that they didn't ask to be on this board. They have to be. Um, and the mayor appoints three uh, additional members, one of which has to be a city council person from the city of Los Angeles. So that's in legislation. That that's one in, of them has to, yes, that's okay. in legislation. And then you have four other members that are elected officials from each of the four different what we call quarters around uh, the city of Los Angeles that represent the other 87 cities. So there are a council member elected at some city, and then th that quadrant, the cities around that quadrant, then select someone. Yeah, it's, it's a very some, complicated okay. process, but essentially we get elected official that represents those areas, like the San Gabriel Valley, the South Bay Gateway okay. area. So that um, it's a, they're almost all elected officials. Right now we have two non-elected officials. One used to be elected official, but isn't any longer. Uh, and so it's a very political board, but our politics are primarily politics of geography. Uh, and it's kind of strange from a political science standpoint, but uh, our board members are there to get improvements in their area. There's a very limited amount of money, and they, all, of course, all want all the money to go into their particular area. Right. So that's what our fights are all about, is how can I get most of the money into my area? So let me ask you a budgetary question, then an organizational question. Maybe the organizational question first. Okay, so we talk about what well, used to be the RTD, et cetera, but I also, you mentioned Metrolink. I see some light blue buses that we call dash buses in downtown. I see the blue bus come by Lincoln Boulevard and Sepulveda. I see a green bus come by. I've heard of the Alameda Corridor, which transports goods to all. None of those are under your jurisdiction. Except we pay for all of them. So you pay for all of them, but none of you don't control any of them. How many uh, well, buses or schedules or anything? We do to some extent. Uh, dash is for the city of Los Angeles. That's paid for by part of the sales tax goes directly to the cities. Correct. Goes through us directly to the cities. But you say you control, but it's going to go to the cities no matter what you do. Right. It's going to go to the cities. And so we have a coordination aspect to it, but we really don't call the shots. We try to coordinate with all the different bus operations. There are 16 official bus operators in the county with us. There okay, so see, there's something confusing there. Yeah. There are 16 bus operators in addition to what we typically see as the MTA buses, which That's now correct. have all kinds of different colors, and they, red and orange. and Right, and, right. and those 16 operators operate about four or 500 buses. Okay. So there's a big component there. Then there are like 200 operators that operate dial-a-ride services and services for disabled and that sort of thing. Again, paid for mostly through by money that goes through us. And then in addition to that, we also have what we call a call for projects where we accumulate money from the federal and state government and from our own sales tax. And uh, periodically, every two or three years, we'll have a call for projects where they'll submit pro transportation projects, and then we'll decide which projects get funding. Okay. What's, your, what's the budget size of the MTA, or we, Metro, excuse we me? We spend uh, about a little over $3 billion a year. $3 billion? Does that include capital projects? That's capital projects as well. Our, our holdings are in the neighborhood of $25 billion. Oh. So if you could wave a magic wand, how would you reorganize Metro? Well, or not even Metro, just all of LA County transportation? It would, that, that, would, that would be fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what would you do? Uh, well, uh, here again, it goes as far as what we can do from a monetary standpoint, that $3 billion needs to be $9 billion just to meet the need that we can identify today. Okay, that ain't so, going to happen. It's not going to happen anytime soon. So there's uh, all kinds of other things that we need to do. Uh, and a lot of that's geared to uh, getting people to look at changing their habits because here again, the problem is there's more people out there and more cars out there than there is 
room to accommodate them and to park them and to deal with all the other kinds of things. Uh, but one of my best examples, and Diana Estrada, my assistant who is here with me today, when we were coming here, uh, the I-10 is a good example. Uh, it's full going both directions all day long. You know, the peaks are really, really terrible, but in a lot of cities, everybody comes in in the morning, goes out at night. San Francisco, everybody comes in and goes out. It's a little, little bit different. Here, our patterns are so, so messed up. They're so uh, frail that it's really hard to identify where the travel patterns are. And what I keep saying about like the I-10 is if, if everybody that worked on the east side lived on the east side, and everybody that worked on the west side lived on the west side, they wouldn't have to wave at each other as they go by. As they go by, but that's the way we've developed. We developed in a very. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people I know way. in East LA that would be willing to trade their houses for some people on the West Side. I, I have. I don't think that'll be the problem. It's just the other way around. I think. Well, but, uh, so we we both live in Pasadena. Okay. Uh, yeah, I live in Pasadena too. I have a lot easier. I was thinking more East LA and then that area. But, oh yeah, uh, but but that's that's really part of the problem. And not only that, you have people that live far away mm -hmm. that come in every day, and so you're creating tremendous uh, vehicle miles of travel because of our own travel patterns and the way we've developed, because we haven't had a, a really good tra transportation system since the 50s. Now, when LA was developing, it had an excellent transit system. That's how the basic LA developed, is through the transit system, red line, yellow line, mm -hmm. you've heard all the names. Uh, and the basic uh, layout of LA was, was from that. Unfortunately, it hadn't developed that much as a city when the automobile came in. And then the the big conspiracy theory, I don't know if, if all of you heard this, but there was really a big conspiracy with the automakers, the, the rubber companies, the gas companies. They all said, California, Southern California, that's a market for us. We can go in and we can saturate that market. We could sell cars. And so they did. And they wiped out the rail lines. They bought the rail lines, sold I off the right I think I saw the movie. Wasn't it like uh, Roger Rabbit or something like that? Well, I don't know how many of you saw that Disney movie. Yeah. No, that's uh, Roger Moore's. Uh, it was, I mean, it, I'm not sure it was a conspiracy or not, mm -hmm. but it worked. And uh, I keep saying today, what we need is another conspiracy like that to kind of bring us back into a, to a transportation system that can handle our movement uh, much better than a single occupant vehicle can. Because not only have we increased in population a great deal, and I have photographs back in 1945 of, of a street here in West Los Angeles. Yeah. Beautiful trees lining grass, beautiful, not a car in sight, a streetcar going down the middle of the street. Uh, 1955, you've got a, the streetcar again, but now you're see, starting to see cars parked. And then today, and you'll see no streetcar or bus, and every single space is filled with an automobile. The driveways are all filled with automobiles. The, line, the, the streets are lined with automobiles. So it's not only a matter of population growth, but now everybody in the house has to have at least one and a half cars. At least. And so you've got so many more cars to deal with, and they're all going everywhere at one time. So a lot of what we're looking at is not only trying to come up with systems that we can help build to accommodate more capacity, but try to look at things that, that we can do that, that will allow us to use the system better. And one of the bigger ones is choosing the right place to live where mm -hmm. you don't have to travel so far. So I'm going to ask Anastasia the same question. If she could wave her magic wand, how would she reorganize? What would she yeah. do? But before I do that, I'm going to ask the audience, all the students and our guests as well, how many of you were on a public transportation bus in the last week? One, two, well, you don't count, man. You, they, okay, four of you, okay, so, wow. Well, it's a little difficult here because I don't think you have really good transit service available to the campus, which is a big problem because only about 10% of the population really has what I would call adequate transport mass transit service available to them. You mean within walking distance yeah, with, easy, for, easy, uh, easy for both home and destination? Right, well, easily accessible one way or the other. Well, 10% 10, 10 though of 10 million, that's a million people. Yeah, and we, and we carry about half of them. Okay. I mean, so where we do have good transit service, like on Wilshire Boulevard, we carry about 30 to 40 percent of the, the traffic on there. But most of the place doesn't have that kind of service mm -hmm. available to Well, them. but I know most of my students are like me. We're for public transit because we want people who are in our way to take public transit so that my car can go faster. I mean, that's always the... the <laughs> I, well, I, I, I would say that if I had a magic wand, I would try to better integrate uh, transportation and land use. I think part of the problem we're facing is that, as you were saying... When you say land use, I know many of our urban planners know what that means, but when, what do you mean exactly yeah, by land where use? Where we are allocating our high-density housing, where we are allocating our uh, different commercial uses, 
Uh, and I think there is a movement here. I think we have reached a point where nobody can go anywhere because we're stuck in traffic. We have reached a point where the gasoline prices have skyrocketed, and we have reached a point where you know, the American dream of single-family homes is not attainable by more than 50% of the people. So we have right. to start thinking in different ways. We have to start thinking that maybe we have to put more higher densities closer to transit lines. Of course, to build a multimodal transportation system that, has, that is happening in Los Angeles, but also where do you concentrate your densities? How can we allocate more high-income housing? How can we find this not in my backyard a symptom with good design models of multifamily housing. I think this is, and, and also the second thing is how okay, to. Okay, but that's your academic side talking. No, it's mm -hmm. not. So not. The practical, no, okay, no. but today, no. given where we are in LA, no. we've tried some of that. And so this transit oriented development yes. that you know much yeah. about, yeah. that the MTA is supposed yeah. to be funding, hasn't been, I mean, we've had this great opportunities with the building of yeah. the blue line and the gold line. Yeah. and. But we haven't done as much as we should have. Yes. Had you started at the beginning 20 years ago when we built the blue line, we would have said, we're going to build a lot of transit-oriented housing, which simply means yeah. building the housing real close to transit stops yeah. so people can walk to them. And, right? But we haven't done it. Well, the blue line, actually, I have studied the blue line quite extensively, and it was a line that was built quite quickly. They used an existing right of way because it was there. It was quite cheaper to use this particular line and also they, the system wanted to build it quickly so that they probably could ensure more federal funds. But at the same time, it was passing through some of the back lots of communities. I mean, under the so, downtown so Los Angeles that, and Long Beach. That you're saying that when we built the line, we didn't ideally say, this is not where the line should go, mm -hmm. but that's where it has to go because that's what we own, yes. even though it's not going by anything. That's true. We built a green line, it doesn't connect to the airport. There is another conspiracy theory there that and there were a lot of <laughs> lobbying of uh, you know, the shuttles, and you probably know better than that, but I think it's, well, we're in one of the very few cities in the world that does not have a line directly connecting to the, to the airports. We, you know, we have a number of major uh, centers, LMU is one, that are not close to, tra to, to major transit lines. So, Integrating, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. integrating. It, things are better with the gold line. I actually have interviewed a number of developers, uh, and that's why we see more housing being built along the gold line. Cities were more prepared for the gold line. We had the cities of Pasadena and South Pasadena really creating plans but that was to an accommodate. That was an existing right away that we used, was that it was, not? Primarily. Well, part, part of it, but it was really going through some of the, uh, you know, denser areas. And talking to some of the developers that have built along the gold line, uh, a lot of them are quite interested in building more housing near transit lines. It's not going to solve all the problems. I don't think that we can say that we're going to do one thing and we're going to fix transportation problems in Los Angeles. But So in my view, we, you have to do a number of, of things, and some of these are already well, What's underway. the most important thing that has to happen? I think that, you know, to have planning departments and transportation departments and metro and kind of coordinating, having the city of Los Angeles understanding what it takes to build more transit-oriented development, providing the right incentives. I know SCAG is working on that. They have the COMPASS program where we allocate density. But for this to happen, it's not going to happen just overnight. You really need to, to give certain incentives to really resolve this whole issue of parking, for example, that, uh, you know, why if you are near a transit line, you have to provide two parking spots that a lot of developers want or have to provide. Uh, there are a number of streamlining some of the processes and uh, permits that you need to get. So if you are uh, near a transit line or, you know, in TOD area, you can build by right certain mm -hmm. things instead of having to wait for one or two years to get the permits, and also pursuing more uh, some joint development projects, I would think. Uh, you mentioned you have a lot of what, what is that joint development? Joint with who? Well, well, let me just kind of jump in here because we, we're doing a lot of this, but a lot of it's going on right now. I mean, 
some of it happened earlier. The gold line was a little bit more ahead of the time, but it's, this is kind of a new phenomenon. Ten years ago, you couldn't get funding for a transit-oriented development, and developers didn't even know what, what it was. But the basic idea behind it is it is a development that is built with a sole purpose of really reducing the number of car trips that need to be made so that it not only includes housing, usually a good one, will include housing of all different kinds of types. So there's diversity in housing type, but it also includes convenience stores. So that means affordable home, it means housing for middle, wealthy, middle right. class, and working class. A, a, a good mix of, mm -hmm. of, of housing, penthouse, all the way down to uh, subsidized housing. Then it also includes uh, convenience types of things, restaurants, uh, and jobs, potential jobs, and being close to a, a, a transit facility, it could be even a bus facility, mm -hmm. uh, that would get people to jobs close by very quickly without having to get in a car. So literally, you could live a lot of your life without ever having to get so in a car. So is Playa Vista that kind of a development? Well, they've, they've had that dream. It just hasn't, it's primarily uh, housing. Mm -hmm. uh, they've talked about putting, uh, and I think Culver City actually does operate a bus around there, but no, I would say yes. not. So what would be an example uh, of one how, that we would know? Well, one that's going around right now is Del Mar uh, in Pasadena, and it's a, uh, uh, and I know it really well because that's where I happen to board the train every day, well, most every day when I, uh, when I ride, because I do ride the Gold Line to work. Uh, but it has housing, 200 and some units. It has a restaurant available to it. It's next to, to Old Pasadena. People walk all over the place there. And you can come downtown in 20 minutes, or a lot of people go to jobs uh, out the other way too. Um, and so it's, it's a, a different kind of lifestyle. And I, I live that urban lifestyle now because I thought it would be fun to do it, and I, and I love it. So I live in, a, in downtown Pasadena, and I walk or take transit mm -hmm. a lot. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had to buy gas the other day. I hadn't bought gas a month and a half. Hey, lucky you. you. Couldn't what, couldn't one thing I want it. to add is, and I don't, uh, you know, I I've, have teenage boys, and oftentimes, you know, trans, if, if you look, it, you know, moving around from the children's perspective, Los Angeles is one of the worst cities because if you don't drive, it is difficult to drive around. Right. And so, you know, for teenagers or, you know, kids over 12 years old, if, if you really build this transit system where they can move around, it's a tremendous, uh, a tremendous thing. And if you look into studies of the independent mobility of children, you see that over the last 20 years, it becomes less and less and less, and kids have to be driven around mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, yeah, by, otherwise too. we wouldn't have soccer bombs. Well, they sure find their way to the beach, though, right. in the summertime. <laughs> so, I mean, when you take a look at this, it seems daunting to me. I don't even know where to start in terms of, what are the success stories of Metro? Well, there's, you know, we have a, we have a lot of success stories, and that's, the, that's part of the problem, is we, we've done a lot, we've, we have done more than any other urban area, to fight congestion, and the Texas Transportation Institute has identified that, that we're way ahead of... Meaning of, traffic could be worse had we not taken all this action. Had we not done all the different kinds of things, and that's highway is, improvements, the so technology... So tra transit use. demand management, is that what we call transit, it? Well, that's, that's one aspect of it. The, uh, well, explain to the students what transit well, demand... Well, on the highways, um, now you have... Uh, you can A lot of the uh, entrances have meters on them. That helps to moderate the flow. I don't like those. They slow me down. Well, they slow you down in one spot, but if you can gain it on, the, on a free-flowing freeway, that's a big advantage. And if you had less cars, it works a little bit better. We're, we're really uh, up, up against a lot of that. The, the information that we have now, we're going to go to a 511 number pretty soon where you'll be able to call on your cell phone, 511, and get all the traffic information. But the radio... Yeah, but while I'm dialing, I slow down and I slow everybody else well, down. Well, you have to use hands-free, too. Oh, so okay. Just, to, just, just, just program it into your phone, and you'll be able to, to, be able to do that. Uh, and then all the, the carpooling programs that, that we do, we do those with employers and, and van pools. We have 600 and some van pools now uh, that, that are out there and, and more, getting more and more of those. The HOV system, we're looking at uh, uh, congestion reduction pricing, but that's still ways off. Well, and explain then, that to the students, how that works. And then the, and then the transit system, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, congestion reduction pricing is where, uh, if you go on to 91 in Orange County, you have a choice of of uh, staying in the main lanes and going slow, or going and buying a, a little transponder, putting it in your windshield. And if you want, if you choose that you really got to get to the other end, then you can pay to go on those lanes, and you can pay less if you have three carpools or whatever. It's all done electronically, and you get billed. But you get you you get charged during the time of day when there's more traffic. Yeah, you get charged hour. more. 
in, in the 91, they do it by hour slots. Depending on what hour you're going through, it costs you more. It can cost you up to $10 uh, in the very uh, peak of the peak. Uh, but if you need to get to Riverside because you have to pick up your kid from daycare or something, it may be worth it to you. And it's, it's a choice. You can stay in the main lanes or you can go on that. Uh, San Diego on I-15 has a, a similar type of thing, but it's dynamic pricing. So it's always measuring the volumes and, and getting the, the, the price up. And what we're looking at is the same type of thing on the 110 and the 210, the 10, the 60, uh, but those would be dy dynamic. And so you, the whole idea is that the pricing would be there to make sure that the lane moves at 50 miles an hour, at least. So there would be a lane added to the 405 or it would the be 10? Th it would be the existing HOV lane. On the 405? On the, no. No, we want the 405. I right? know. No, we, <laughs> I, I want the, but we're going to just be Oh, just a 10, okay. Yeah, the, we're going to be building the northbound HOV lane. Metro actually will be building that lane. On the uh, 10? On the 10, or no, on the 405. The 10 will use the existing HOV lane if we ever do this. But the idea is to keep that lane moving by pricing. So the, the more it starts to slow down, the more cost to get on it. Uh, but now, to make that work, you have to have something to sell, so that means you have to have the lane working, so right. that means you have to have a lot more bus service, express bus service on it, a lot more van pools. But this lane doesn't exist right now. Uh, it, it exists, but it's an HOV lane. Oh, okay. Except there is a big gap in a, on a, on right. a 10. So. Hey, so $3 billion a year is spent by Metro, okay? Part of that comes from the gas tax. Um, I've always heard people or elected officials saying, we don't want to, right now for every gallon, how much is the gas tax? It's 28 cents. So 28 cents for every gallon goes for the gas tax. How much of that goes to the feds? 14 cents. And the rest of it goes locally in the state? And to the state. What, what, all 14? And then it comes back to you, some of it comes back to you? What we, all that the, the gas tax that you pay all the time goes for is trying to maintain the freeways, the state system. So every time you buy a gallon of gas, 28 cents, goes to the federal government for transportation. Well, 14 for to the feds and 14 to the state. Okay. And the, no matter what the price of gas is. Right. And that we've always said that that's not the proper thing to do. We used to, you used to, it hasn't changed since 1992. Everything else has gone up since that. 28 time. cents since in 1992? 1992. And gas was only what, like less than a dollar? Yeah. And so. We should have done it proportionately then. Yeah, but, the, but it's a political call and politicians don't want to raise it. And so what's happening is, um, the gas tax you pay barely maintains the state system. Yeah, but the politicians would always say, we don't want to raise the gas tax because people will feel it, it'll impact it, yet gas continues to rise all the time and people continue to Well, you, you it. feel it anyhow because that congestion costs you a heck of a lot of money. Well, the, the rough roads cost you in, in suspension problems, steering problems, and, and more gas usage. Uh, it's costing you one way or the other. It, it could save you a lot of money if we could uh, improve our system, but... That's so what, what would you do if we doubled it? What would you be able to do? If How you, much faster can I go on the freeway if we doubled it? Over the next 20 years, if you, and you kept it up, yeah. you'd, ha you'd be able to probably cut off a, or be able to go a few miles an hour faster than you are now. Okay. Here's a survey time. Okay. You're currently paying anywhere from 360 to, I've seen gas as high as 450 a gallon for premium. Okay. Um, out of that, it's 28 cents. Okay, if we were able, if we were to double that, okay, to 54 cents, and uh, we can maintain or even decrease your time a little bit, how many of you would be willing to do that? Raise your hand. Hmm, it's going to be a tough sell. Well, it's well. Let me tell you, tomorrow, tomorrow, a whole bunch of people in the Middle East might decide to do that to you anyhow. Yeah. yeah. And so, and you're not going to see a bit of benefit out of that. Yeah. So it, but the, there's, I mean, the politicians are right. We don't want to pay. We want the service, but we don't want to pay for it. Right. But my, but the gas tax is not paying for better mobility for you. It's, it's not even keeping up what our parents provided to us. So, and the, and the federal tax is really strange because the, the transportation trust fund is going to go broke next year. Now, how does that work? We're paying all this money into it. Well, I suppose, you know, print more money, but it's, they're, they're spending more money than they're getting in. So, um, Anastasia, what would you suggest in terms of funding? I mean, we, we, you know, people aren't willing to be taxed. Every time we ask this question, will you pay more? They say no, and they ask, well, do you want more services? And of course, everybody says yes, they want more, but we don't want to pay for it. Yeah. No, I think it is, it is a very tough uh, dilemma. I think what um, 
Mr. Snobble was describing about um, the opportunity if you really want to, uh, to to run faster, there is a lane that you can pay for it. So it gives at least the option to people. So but many people call that the Lexus or BMW lane. Yeah. All those people with Lexus and BMWs and, will and pay for it. He also said that if you do that uh, and you get, if all the proceeds, the revenue you get, you invest into buses and into a public, into a public transit system, then you give something back to all these people who cannot afford it. That's so right. I think, you know, if there is this, then it is more um, acceptable, I think, by the larger public. But, but it is a tough sell. I mean, congestion pricing, I think almost all academic transportation planners, if you ask them, they would say that congestion pricing is the way to go. All politicians would say it will never happen because it's not popular. Uh, no, they, it, was proven, it was proven here. But let's be honest. In Los Angeles, taking public transit means you're poor and minority. Okay? Or you work for the MTA. Um, well, actually... Uh, <laughs> uh, in New York, it's okay if you're middle class and even upper middle class to take public transit. It's okay. But in LA, it's not that... You know, nobody drives in L.A. is that the nobodies walk in L.A. or take public transit. Because, and I think that there are great strides that have been taken, especially with, you know, the Orange Line, with uh, the Metro Rapid, et cetera, because, you know, up to very recently, the reputation that the buses had were that they were sometimes unsafe, that they were not reliable, that you could wait on the bus stop and the bus wouldn't stop because it was... Too full, too full, or, or uh, you know, or the you, you driver could not, wanted to get to lunch, or if something. you wanted to be on time uh, to go to work, you could not rely on the bus. So they have this terrible reputation, and I know this from surveys also of transit riders, and, yeah. and in me, in some areas, not in the South Bay area, but downtown areas, also complaints about safety, etc. So, uh, but there have been great strides. I think the fact that uh, you can, I, I remember one of my favorite stories. I'm saying is that I was, I, I listen a lot to. As I'm driving from Pasadena to UCLA, and I don't have a very good transit alternative <laughs> to do so. Uh, I'm listening a lot on public radio, and they had a story where uh, someone hopped on the bus in New York, Manhattan, and someone in, got into the Metro Rapid in Los Angeles. And the New York bus was stuck in traffic, and the Los Angeles bus was quite faster. And so I think that there are great things that are happening, uh, and I think that the other thing... You know, it's always an unfair comparison about Manhattan. I mean, Manhattan is like, from here to UCLA, I've got all of Manhattan, yeah. you know, and how many lines. So oh. it's not, I mean, the density in, in New York, just in terms of the short amount of time, when people say, oh, yeah, I'll take the metro, that, like, you're on it for five minutes. Yeah. Here, the, the distances are so much greater in terms of the investment that you would have to make, Absolutely. et cetera. So yeah. uh, is there another comparable city that's sprawled like ours that has a public transit system that works? And, and I'm not talking about, you know, London or Paris, or the, those are all pretty, even though they're larger cities, the, they're, much the, the, they're much, more, much more compact. But they also grew up around transit. I mean, they were actually developed because there wasn't an automobile option at the point, and so they had to come up with, yeah. with better transit uh, options, and, and we didn't uh, have that opportunity, so we're, we're catching up. But we are, there are a lot of successes out there. And just six years ago, when I first got here, only about 10% of our riders um, had a car available to them and chose to ride the bus. Today, it's like 25% of our riders and what's, have what, a car. What? Because of gas? Or what's going on Well, with that? part of it's because of the gas Better prices. service? Better because, but, timing? But, but now you have the rapid bus, which is a lot, lot faster. Because is that the red one? The, yeah, the, the technology. Here again, we use technology and different kinds of ideas. We have the largest rapid bus system in the country, probably the world. Uh, and that does add speed back, so all of a sudden it's better uh, than, than a regular bus. What does that mean you use technology? The light turns green when it's approaching? Yeah, when the bus, the bus communicates with the signal system, and so it's all How do I get one of those systems in my car? <laughs> <laughs> Cost you a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, so there is technology like that that we're, that we're coming up with. The Orange Line has a, uh, is a, been a great success, and I'd venture to say that a lot more people on the Orange Line have cars available to them than on the bus. Uh, on a regular bus today in West Los Angeles, you can walk many times faster than you can take the bus because it's stuck in traffic. Right. And so it's not going to give you any better service. That's why we're looking at exclusive lanes like on the Wilshire Boulevard. If we can make the bus go faster, we'll get a lot more market share out of it because speed really matters to people. So listen, all the planners and academics, if it was just us three, we could completely revise the system. And, and no problem with that. 
The problem is the, the elected officials. An example is Mayor Antonio Villaragosa, to try to improve transportation on the west side, decided to turn Pico and Olympic into one ways, streets, one going west and one going east, and saying that will increase traffic. All the studies prove him right. All the technology that we talk about yeah. should do it. Yeah. It's not going to be done. Now he's decided that both are going to stay yeah. both ways, but on one, there will only be one lane going one way and the other. And even then, the local council member is screaming, saying over his dead body. the businesses are screaming. Yeah. Well, well, there are some hard political decisions it's politics. that our leaders have to take, I guess. There is this. And, and the other thing is that, you know, one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, I think all of us have a role in, in this. And the other part is, you know, employers. And I think my, my colleague, um, Don Shoup, has actually argued, I think, at least effectively in academia, that employers have a role to play when, for example, you are subsidizing your employees in downtown Los Angeles, their parking, you can instead give them $200 in their pocket if they use the bus. Or, you know, what UCLA is doing, the Bruin Go program, where it really, uh, all the UCLA employees, students, etc. it costs only a quarter to get uh, from Culver City or Santa Monica if you get the bus. So if you really you know, target the pocket of people, you may have some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some success, but there are only certain entities that, that can do that, and yeah. some of the big employers well, can do that. Because a state entity like UCLA can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, but downtown is really not the problem. In terms of transportation, downtown actually moves pretty well. I mean, you, you got... Well, it's still the largest, you know, the employer. most densely uh, employment area. Yeah, Correct. Yeah. And, it does, and, you know, there are times when it's really miserable. Uh, in downtown, mm -hmm. unless you know your way around. But I want to make one point, particularly for your students today. Uh, it's not just enough to be a good planner. To be successful and get anything done, you have to work through the community process. Because no matter what happens, you're going to be in front of a community. That you're going to have literally uh, hundreds of thousands of people that want transportation improvements or any other kind of improvement. And you're going to have a handful of people who don't want it because it's going to affect them at that moment in time. And going through the environmental process is a daunting task. It takes a long, long time. And the system is set up to stop projects, not to enhance projects. And so you can have a situation where a small number of people can hold up uh, and cost the public a huge amount of money uh, that, for an improvement that will literally serve millions of people. So the EIR, the Environmental Impact Report, right. it impacts any project, whether it's a public project or a private project, whether it's transportation for you to build a metro line, you have to go through this whole process. Even though we all intuitively know that we need to extend the red line to the sea, that we need to build more transit, we still have to spend millions, tens of millions of dollars to study this. Well, not only that, studying it, going through all the legal proceedings, which mm -hmm. costs a lot of money, and then may not, at the end, you may not be able to get it done. There's a segment of a freeway uh, here in Los Angeles County, which is actually the last gap in the intersect. Inter yeah, we were talking system. about that right before you got here, the 710. The 710 yeah. for 40 years. That, for four, using the on. EIR process or the legal process or the judicial? Yeah, just the community and, you know, there's huge numbers of city councils, for example, in the San Gabriel Valley who keep voting and saying they want it, they need it, and all that sort of thing. The SCAG says it's the, it's the biggest single project we could do from an air quality standpoint, but yet we still aren't any closer to actually building it today than we were 40 years ago. Okay. I'm going to ask the students if they have any questions in, in, a, in a second, but the orange line, talk about how revolutionary that is. And talk, I keep thinking of the Brazilian city that everybody keeps Cortiba. going to. What is it? Coritiba, Brazil. Coritiba, Brazil. Right. Now, they had the advantage that they started new, right? Well, they had the advantage that they can do things a lot easier. No, no EIRs in Brazil? Uh, no, not really. No, okay. They're, the mayor said, hey, let's do it, and it got done. So, I mean, that's a little, diff little different well, Talk about process. Curitiba, talk about the Orange Line, and talk about the possibility of new, uh, new expansions in terms of the Orange Line. I'm, I am so proud of the Orange Line. Um, Hold I've, on. Have any, any of you ever been on the Orange Line? Yeah. One, two. Okay. Do any of you know where the Orange Line is? In the San Fernando Valley. It's in the San Fernando Valley. It runs east-west. East-west uh, for 14 miles, something like that. It's the fastest way to get, to, to get across the valley. It was an old interurban and freight uh, rail right-of-way. So an existing right-of-way, meaning that the government owned the property or somebody the owned the property, the contiguous. Right, a railroad owned it. And, we, and uh, Metro purchased it back when we were one of the other agencies. 
we purchased a lot of railroad right of ways because we tried to preserve all those the right of ways. They're very val valuable. Uh, and so uh, as a person that came up in the bus side as a bus planner and that sort of thing, I've always thought what we really, rail isn't magic. A lot of people will say they'll ride rail before they'll ride bus. And so I've always fought for how we could figure out how people should accept the bus as being as good as rail. Uh, and it's just a matter of speed and comfort and those such, sorts of things. And so when we had the opportunity to look at the, the uh, orange line, it's not quite a big, a dense enough corridor to really look at going with light rail or a heavier capacity system. And so the decision was made that we should really go with a, uh, a, uh, a bus rapid transit based on the model we got from Coritiba, Brazil. Where is Curitiba, Brazil, relative to Rio or Brasilia I or I Sao Paulo? I don't know. I'm a oh, you've never been? I'm a geographer. I've never been there, and oh, I, don't, okay. I don't remember seeing it on the map, so I really don't know. Okay. But some of our, many of our politicians at the time went down and saw it and said, gee, this could really work. And on a plane coming back, they drew some maps, and uh, it wasn't four or five years later that um, we actually started construction on, on it. The, the keys to it are it it's simply operates like a rail line. It has stations that are about every mile apart. Uh, it has large vehicles, these large articulated bus. In fact, I operate the biggest bus in the country. I, I just thought you should know that. Um, <laughs> and I tell that to all my colleagues, too, because one of our buses is 65 feet long that uh, they make So even us. in uh, planners have size envy and all that yes, kind of uh, stuff. All right. Yes. We look at all kinds of things we can be proud of, and, yeah. that's, and that's one of them. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's its own street. And so the bus doesn't have to deal with traffic except at intersections. And there we've worked very closely with the city of Los Angeles to time the intersections and to coordinate with the signals and everything. So that makes the bus trip really fast. It's our own pavement. It's really smooth. You have to ride that same bus on Wilshire Boulevard. There's totally different ride quality. Uh, big windows, air conditioned, uh, all the kinds of things that you would normally The buses to. almost look like a, a, uh, I wanted, a rail. I wanted a bus that looked like more like a rail car. And I told the manufacturer when we were ordering these buses, I didn't want a bread box. I wanted something that looked more like a rail car, had more lighting, better lighting, you know, it was much more friendly, had uh, more inside space for standing, that sort of thing. And they came through. They, they really provided So you can literally you take this bus and drive it off and into the yes. streets. Now, you wouldn't want to do that, but you could do that. Well, no, we do, because the same bus, we have over 200 of them. They operate on many of our rapid bus buses. Oh, okay. It's the same bus. It's just on the orange line, we paint them gray. And, that, and we do have the 65-foot bus, which we had to get an exemption, because you can only operate a 60-foot bus. So we had from, to get, to get it sent from, from who? From the state of California, Caltrans, because we still had to get it from the alignment to the garage. So okay. we had to get that exemption. So there's a state law that prohibits buses from being longer than 60 feet. Right. We're working on getting that changed because mm -hmm. we're going to, yeah, I like the 60. In fact, we're looking at an 80-foot bus for there now because it's been so popular. It was, we're, we're exceeding our projections for 2020 now. So are there plans for another orange line there's, type of a, uh, a route? We're right now doing, in fact, I think today that we're having uh, the public hearings and looking at going through the environmental process to extend it four miles to the north up to the Metrolink station uh, farther north. So we did add Could it be the same line, you're the saying? The same line, the same bus would go up there. Uh, we're, we are looking at a couple other quarters, but we don't have any other quarters that we own actually that are Why quite can't we compatible. take an existing street and do that? Well, we can, and that's what the, the, we're looking at uh, working with the cities to come up with exclusive lanes in the, in the road so that they would be dedicated to bus. We wouldn't have to deal with other traffic because a lot of our delays are caused by accidents and, yeah. and people stalling in the lanes and things so like that. So for every mile to extend the gold line or the green line or the blue line, which is a light rail system, and then for every mile to extend the orange line, what's the cost? <laughs> That's a really big range, actually, depending on if your, your structures. Subways are up into the $400 million a mile. So $400 million for every mile of an underground system, a subway, what we consider a subway like in New York and London, right, and what we have in terms of down uh, Wilshire, right. in, in what we call the red line, yeah. 400 miles an hour. And I take exception with, because our engineers are saying that, but we just built um, essentially four miles of tunnel on the east side extension, which is the world's best tunneling exercise so far. Uh, and it didn't cost us anywhere near that. It was more in the $200 million range. So, it's, so I that think was you, mostly under public land and all of that. Oh, yeah. Huh? Well, they all are. I mean, uh, you can't just go under anybody's land. You have to get rights to it or go under public right-of-way. So most of the tunneling is under private right-of-way. Uh, on the east side, it's right under First Street, okay. under Boyle right. Heights. 
Uh, and so that if you do it right, you can probably do things uh, a little bit less expensive. But you know, when you plan things, you have to kind of look at okay, the Okay, so the, how about the gold line, which goes from downtown L.A. to Pasadena, and now we're extending it down to the uh, to Sierra Madre. What What is that per mile? Well, that's probably less expensive. That's actually not uh, a project in our plan yet. A lot of people would like to see that, but we don't have it funded, uh, and there is no funding for it. But you're probably talking in the neighborhood of 50 to 75 uh, million dollars per, per mile. mile there, because you have the right, you own the right of way. There aren't a lot of structures. There are not a lot of crossings. It's a it's a very nice situation. Uh, on the on the east side extension that we're doing through Boyle Heights, with, that's the goal line too. I think uh, there we're probably up in 100 million dollars okay. a, a mile. And then the it, orange line, you're going to extend it four miles. Yeah, what is that? That's cheap. That's the you know, for the whole thing, it's going to be like $150 million for four, four miles. So it's, it's a lot less so expensive. So 25 to 30. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the, the, the big difference. So why don't we do many more orange lines? Well, and here again, the whole secret to planning is putting the right tool in the, for the right job. What happens oftentimes is people get in their heads that they want light rail, and that's all that they want, even though a rapid bus could serve them much better and a lot, a lot cheaper. Are you it's, talking about the exposition line? No, 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 because exposition uh, does need to have light rail because the, the ridership will be so heavy, we need to have that, that additional capacity. And that's, a, that's what it is. It's, it's looking at what you need to carry the number of people that you're going to have to carry. Uh, and, the, you know, you, the bus has so much capacity, you get the rapid bus, has a little bit better capacity, a little bit faster speed. You go light rail, you get more capacity, or more capa or BRT, you get more capacity, faster speed. And so you keep mm -hmm. up going. And the art of our work is to put the right tool in the right place. It's just like you wouldn't cut down a, a, a redwood tree with a coping knife. Right. Um, you'd use a, you know, a tree saw. So that's one of the real arts of our business is to, to identify the right solution that will last you for the next 20 years and be then you can upgrade it as, as, as demand uh, dictates. So in the plans right now, what is being expanded that you actually have budget for or um, plan to get money for? Well, that's for? what we're doing. That's why we, I brought this with me, because we're right in the middle of, the, of our process for uh, in updating our long-range plan. Uh, it's the 2008 long-range plan, and this is all going through public hearings right now. Unfortunately, because of cost increases and reductions in state funding and things like that, uh, the projects that were in our old 2001 plan are still the projects that are in this plan, and even though we're adding five years of funding, we can't add anything new to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this plan is out there to, to be reviewed. A lot of people would really like to add a lot of new things, like the Gold Line extension uh, to all the way to Montclair, mm -hmm. um, the, the subway to the sea, the, the Expo Phase Two, Crenshaw Corridor, which would actually serve the airport. Uh, all those are, are uh, projects that we're, we're looking at. Crenshaw is in here. Um, Expo Phase 2 is in here, but there's no money for subway at this point. There's no money for the Gold Line extension or some of the other uh, uh, big improvements that uh, we'd really like to be able to do because there's just not money for it. Okay. Jeff has got the mic over here. Who's got a question? Any questions, comments, right. suggestions? Anybody wants some trip analysis, how to get to anywhere? He's the guy. He'll tell you how to get there. So come on over to the side. And then Cornelius, you got a question too. Come over to the side right after that. So, okay. And your question is? Hi, my question is for Mr. Snowball. So I am 19 years old and have never in my life taken any sort of public transportation because I've, like my, I've sort of grown up with the idea that it's not a safe thing to do. And so how safe would you say the public system is today? Like do... Um, like muggings and assaults still take place on the public system, or is that a stereotype of the past? Well, that's that's a stereotype, and it's not necessarily from the past. I don't know if it's really ever been that true. You're safer on a bus or a rail car than you are standing on the street corner. Uh, that, that's just a simple fact of the matter. The, the rail line, uh, the rail lines, the safety record is uh, is very very good. Now we do have arrest. Uh, we'll have drunks. We'll have disorderly conduct. Well, that's conduct. usually a fraternity party or something like that, but uh. yeah, those, those kinds of things happen, um, and there are there are occasional robberies uh, and that sort of thing, but to a less extent than you would have uh, in a street corner or public buildings and that sort of thing. We do take safety very seriously. We have like every bus has like about eight cameras on it, uh, so if there is every a, single bus has eight cameras, single, and uh, that's all can be downloaded. We have. 
uh, tremendous records. And uh, unfortunately, that's a forensic kind of thing. If something does happen, we catch catch the people pretty quickly. Uh, but we have undercover officers. We have TSA uh, things going on. Uh, one of our biggest fears is terrorists. Uh, although terrorists, um, yeah, the London thing were buses that were blown up. Exactly. Well, and that's been the case for a long time, going back to Ireland and Israel. You know, buses being blown up. So that's something we always worry about. We do a great deal of work on on that. We work closely with Homeland Security uh, on those kinds of issues. But just from a basic um, behavioral kind of thing, we insist on proper behavior on the bus uh, and the rail system. Uh, we have good coverage. We're looking at now increasing that coverage. We're looking at better ways of being able to do this. We have a good um, technology that we use as well. Uh, we're looking at detection equipment. Uh, we just made a big arrest yesterday for a graffiti artists. We've arrested about four or five of them here in the last six months because they do a lot of damage oh, yeah. to us. Uh, and what happens is they they decide that they don't want to hit us anymore and they go and hit public buildings. And, right. and so they... Uh, that's just a big thing, but uh, we work really hard on on, on uh, having a safe and secure system, and it really truly is. Not that there, can are, I not that there are things that happen, you know. Anastasia, you've done research yeah. in this area. I, I, I want to say that um, being on the bus or inside the train is certainly much safer uh, mm -hmm. than being on the street, where more of the incidents are happening are waiting for the bus or on your way to, to the, the bus stop or to the transit train. So just take your car that, you know, and park your there, and then you cannot can, uh, control. The other point I want to make, actually two more points, is that there are very few, what, what FBI distinguishes between type one crime and type two crime. And type one crime are really the serious crime, the rapes, the murder, uh, murder you know, uh, aggravated assault, etc. There are not that much of those, but there is quite a lot, and it goes quite underreported, of uh, type two crime. Uh, and this is more of the quality of life, you know, obscene language, public drunkenness, uh, sometimes uh, groping for women, etc. And it is quite underreported. And I know this by serving um, right. a lot of, because number one, people don't think that the police can do much about it. Number two, a lot of uh, the transit riders are immigrants and they don't particularly trust uh, the police or are scared of the police. And so there are some of these issues that mostly happen in the public realm rather than on the bus or inside the train. And so it, it does become important where you locate these bus stops and, you know, lighting and things like that that are not necessarily within the metro's jurisdiction. There are other agencies that are also responsible. No, but, when, but nowadays when we, like on the, the Gold Line extension, one of, uh, with all the different kinds of things that we have going on and, and all of the opportunities for economic development, joint development on the gold line before it's open have already been taken care of. I mean, we've, they're, they're already going, which is right. far different. But we also do have a whole process of planning the routes to the rail stations mm -hmm. so that we can make sure they're lit properly, there's, we're, there's wayfinding signs, uh, and it's a much more pleasant environment for people yeah. to walk in a much safer That's very important. Yeah. Um, I also remember when some of these uh, lines opened up, there was actually some criticism that many of them were over-policed, that we were spending way too much money on policing the, um, the, the red line and some of the, these lines that you, you were, there were more police per person on some of these transit lines than anywhere else in, in, in LA. So I remember hearing a lot about that. The second thing is the one I, way I always win a bet is people talk about graffiti and all that. I always say, uh, I'll give you a dollar for every bus that you see graffiti on. But uh, it, but you have to give me five bucks if you don't find one that day, and it's it's amazing. People make the assumption that there's graffiti's on buses, but next time you're driving around, take a look at an MTA bus. Uh, the chances are you'll see no graffiti on them. It's pretty amazing. The worst part are the windows now because they they like to etch the windows, yeah. right. and that's where we've been concentrating a lot of our effort, and we put people in jail for that. Yeah. Hey, um, Nicole, I know you have the uh, survey that uh, we took. Uh, if you don't mind getting in line and telling us what the answers were to the questions about subway to the sea. So, um, Cornelius, oh, you have them right there? That's a question I was going to ask. Oh, okay. Well, so, why don't you, uh, are you going to ask that? Okay. G give uh, the question and then let, let Mr. Snowball know about this. Well, Mr. Snowball, we asked on the, the innovative leaving center for the center of L.A. exit poll. That's Dr. Gary Smiles. He's, he's kind of like has a B minus right now. Okay. He's trying to get to the B. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. Yeah. Well, 
So, True story, professor. I actually applied to US, USC. I got in. This guy writes my letter of recommendation for UCLA. Didn't get in. So. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You know, you can only whatever you got to work with, man. <laughs> uh, the question we asked was, would you support a half cent uh, tax increase to support the MTA project known as Subway to the Sea? Uh, for the city of LA, 54% of respondents said yes, 31% said no, and 15% were unsure. So the question I was really going to ask is, what is your strategy to kind of get this project through? Are you going to put it on the ballot? Uh, what is the board going to do? What is the consensus of the board? And my second question is, if you had the power, who would you remove off your board? <laughs> who, 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 who would you add to your board? Who are the best board members to work with? Uh, so, <laughs> okay. so let's, let's, are, deal, let's deal with that first question, just yeah, to contextualize uh, for Mr. Snowball. Um, about 80% of the students that are here participated on February 5th. We had 200 students out doing an exit poll in the city of Los Angeles, and we have 25,000 respondents. And wow. we asked them over uh, um, 2,500, I'm sorry, what did I say? 25,000. Oh, excuse me, 2,500 respondents, yeah. which is very good, okay? <laughs> Um, I, um, and we had over 60 some odd questions. One of those questions was the subway to the sea. So I think there's been talk about putting a ballot measure on there to fund that, but it would require two thirds, which is 67%. And as you can see, we only had 54% with little, very little information, but only 31% were opposed. So as long as we keep it under 33% opposed, we're okay, so with a little bit of advertising, et cetera, we may be able to get to the two-thirds. Uh, so that's where that question is com coming from. Uh, well, that's a really good question because... Uh, Thank you, I wrote it. <laughs> the, uh, the, the thing about the subway to the sea is that's really an important element for West Los Angeles. The rest of the county uh, calls it the drain to the sea. And so they don't want to put their money into funding that because they don't view it as the, something that they will use. Uh, and the simple fact of the matter is when we look countywide, and we've surveyed this, a ballot measure that was just for the subway to the sea that just had that would not pass by a lot. Okay, and we were only asking city residents, which right. are much more biased. It would be much yeah. better in the city, but it right. would still not pass. If, in the same token, if we had a ballot measure that didn't include the subway to the sea, it yeah. wouldn't pass. So it's not a matter of one project uh, that is necessary to, to solve some of the mobility problems because we have a vast county here. There's many mobility needs of all kinds of different kinds. Uh, so for us to really go to the voters and say, we'd like to, to ask you to pay another quarter cent sales tax mm -hmm. or half cent sales tax, we really got to give people things that they need for each of their areas. This really gets down to be in the local election. And so you have to really identify what's important. Obviously. Um, what would be important on the west side would be the subway. What would be important on, in the San Gabriel Valley would be the Gold Line extension right. and freight goods, goods movement. What's important on the South Bay area is the 710 and the ports and the bridges down there. What's important in the San... So we have to add everything. So you, so you really need to have a very well-balanced program that gives people something that they can relate to and actually does uh, uh, solve mobility problems and also uh, has a very big air quality issue because air quality is going to be part of it. So we really, uh, and that's what we, if you look in this plan and you look at the strategic plan, um, uh, the, the actual plan that's funded uh, is, is in this plan. And that's, those projects we know we can do. But then the next section is the first tier of the strategic plan. That's a package of projects that would really work uh, to improve mobility throughout the county. And that would be the package of projects that we would be looking at to go to some greater funding source, such as a half-cent sales tax, or a, be it a, you know, just for Los Angeles County, a license fee tax, a, a local gas tax. There's a lot of different kinds of things we could take a yeah. look at. Now let's deal with that second question without names, <laughs> okay? Um, you have a 13-member board, elected, some appointed, but none of them is it is transportation their main job? None of them are elected directly to be on this board. Right. They have all kinds of other duties, and they see this as a committee. They meet once a week or every two weeks? No, or once a month. Once, they only meet once a month. Okay, they all have other jobs. We have committee meetings. We, yeah, uh, right. You know, one committee meeting a month and then one board meeting. What, what would you say about disbanding this board and having a, a direct election like we do for the school board that only deals with education 
or water boards that only deal with water, that there would be a transportation board that people would be directly elected to and deal only with transportation. Would you be in favor of something like that? Um, it depends Nothing on, against these yeah. current 13 board members who can fire you tomorrow, but go ahead. <laughs> the, uh, you, we think a lot about this, and this has been an issue at the state legislature for a while, too. Uh, there, are, there are examples of elected boards, like BART is an elected board. And, uh, BART is up in San Francisco. San Francisco. That, uh, and if you had uh, enough of the board members that were elected at large, mm -hmm. because otherwise, if it's just by district, like it is at the school board or the county or that sort of thing, then you still get back into the whole thing about geography. And I want all the money in my area. I deserve it. It's my turn. Whatever the arguments are, right. you still get down to that that kind of geographical thing, regardless of anything else. Uh, but if you had some large members who are really responsible for the entire county and held responsible for, are you really making this county better? Yeah, but you know that you people like me would immediately oppose that because I'm willing to bet that most of the at-large members would be white and there would be very few Latinos on there. And when your ridership is majority Latino, so, I mean, I always make the point that well, we our transportation problems would be over tomorrow if every non-Latino used transportation to the same percentage as Latinos do. It'd be done. There'd be no transportation to problems tomorrow, okay? So, I, get, as studying elections, at-large elections and all that, they are tremendously biased against uh, Latinos in African America. So that would be a problem. Well, but, but, and you're looking at it from that Yeah, angle, from that, and, and there I, comes politics again. And I certainly yeah. understand that. I'm just saying... No, I understand politics, the geography of politics that you talked about. And my politics are, are very little from right. a standpoint of, of race. I mean, our, our writership is made up of what it's made up of. We recognize that, and, and, and we appreciate that. We think that's really an important aspect. It doesn't make any, any really real difference. Uh, people are going to respond to good transportation no matter no matter what. But if you aren't looking at it from a holistic standpoint, then it is just nothing but a political fight. Right now, and, and just in, in the, my board gets a lot of you know a lot of bad rap to it, and we do have a lot of public arguments. But I'll, I will tell you, um, my my uh, kind of gauge on a good board meeting is how many no votes I get. And I very rarely get a no vote. Okay. Uh, the, the board works it out. They, they, they compromise. Um, I did get a no vote last board meeting on the gate issue. One. There wasn't another no vote that whole day. So uh, you, if you really look at it from a standpoint of what we accomplish, even though the press sometimes makes it look a little bit differently. And the other thing that, I mean, you get into some silly things like we can't come up with a color for the expo line. But right. that's, that's really, really What he's rare. talking about is every transit line has been given a color. We've talked about the orange line, the red line, the green line, the blue line. And we have a new line exposition. Well, we call it the expo line. But to be consistent, we need to give it a color. We're talking to Pittsburgh Paint about developing an expo color. Right. So like the big debate on the board that they haven't settled is what's the color. <laughs> okay. Now, but it is important because many, uh, many of the people believe that Expo has already gotten a name recognition and all that, and they want to maintain that. So, Anastasia, do you have any comments about the governance issues in terms of the MTA or transit? No, not really. I, I'm not very familiar, so I don't want to make comments on things that I'm not very familiar. But I do know that once we had a UCLA student on your board, and that was... Uh, oh, yeah. I thought right. it was great that, uh, you know, there is someone, good. young person, a student, and uh, she's on uh, the MTA board. So yeah, she was. I was she very was a appreciative planner. of that. So what Alex was that? Uh, that was an appointee by the mayor. Then mayor must have Hall. been. Yeah. 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 An Asian American woman. Yeah. Right. Very smart. She was great. Right. Yeah. Then the mayor lost the election. Um, anyway, <laughs> had they appointed an LMU student, it might have been a different story. <laughs> so. Um, I, whoa, this is loud. Um, I live downtown this summer, and uh -huh. so I happen to be in the perfect place to be taking the subway and buses just about everywhere we went this summer. But um, now that I live back in Westchester, I never take public transportation. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is, I mainly used, uh, went out of Pershing Square and um, 7th and Figueroa, and it cost $1.25 to um, ride that line one time. Um, but I was, ne I never had a ticket collected. I never had to swipe my ticket. No one ever asked if I had one. And I started noticing after writing it for about a week that I was the only person buying the tickets. 
Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to save my $1.25. Um, but I didn't because I was afraid of the $200 ticket that I could have possibly gotten. But uh, why don't, uh, why isn't there any sort of ticket collection? Why isn't that enforced that people are buying their $1.25 tickets? Um, because I know that there were some sort of like electronic looking stands that looked like you were supposed to put something in there, but no one was watching, there was nothing blocking you. So what's the deal with that? Well, that's called the honor system. <laughs> 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 and uh, the, the thing about that is that we believe most people are honest and will pay the fare, and that's actually true. About 80% of our writers now write on passes, day pass, weekly pass, monthly pass. UCLA students all get a pass uh, for the semester tap pass like this, and they can just tap and go anywhere they want. They want. Uh, USC only allows their faculty to do that. They don't let their students do it. But that, that might be something you might, might want to talk about. Yeah, sure. Coming up with a program for us. Um, the whole idea behind that is a light rail fare collection system where you don't always, can't put barriers in. Uh, and we have had some problem. About 5% of our, of our riders choose not to, uh, to pay the fare. Uh, and uh, they do end up getting tickets. The old concept when we first developed this was that with, if they didn't pay their fare, we figured they're not paying their fare 10 times and they go to court and the judge would slap them with a, a, a fee that was 10 times the fare and so we'd recover all that. Well, in the 20 years since, the, the judges all figured, well, they just keep the money themselves and so all the money now goes to the courts and we don't hardly get any money back at all uh, from that. Um, and so we've, we've been up, up in our inspections that the sheriffs do and the fair inspectors do. And in the subways, now last month the board voted to go to gates. So we will be having fair collection gates. And they will be uh, tied into the tap, tap cards. So we'll be going to electronic cards. Uh, a lot of these are already out there. I think monthly passes now you can mm -hmm. buy. Uh, for these, and so uh, we're going to be not only increasing the enforcement on it, uh, but we'll have the gates, and it'll be much harder to get through the subway with the gates. The way I want the Urban Lecture Series from the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of LA we, at Loyola Marymount University. We really welcome or thank you for uh, participating. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> <laughs>